Welcome back to another video. My name is Tom Nash, former senior financial analyst turned YouTuber. Welcome to another video. This is a beautiful Sunday morning and I'm doing this video as a follow up. I did a video about Palantir as one of the most interesting stocks to buy and hold for the rest of this and next year. And I got a ton of questions in the comment section, both from people who like the stock, from people who hate the stock, from people who didn't understand my video, don't understand the stock. And just general questions about the company because it is a very complicated company and i get it so i decided to make this deep tie video now what i don't do in my videos is regurgitate stuff like some other youtubers do just for the numbers so whatever i said in the previous video stays in the previous video if you want to go and watch it i'm going to put the link right here go check it out i'm not going to regurgitate it just to fill more time get more clicks etc etc i don't do that shit. now another thing i don't do I don't hold you hostage for the duration of the video to find out my bottom line. Let me give it to you right now. So Palantir essentially is a question of faith. The bears and the bulls diverge on mainly one point and one point only, which is the multiplier, the sales to price multiplier. If you think that this is a consultancy firm, probably you're looking at a 10 to 11 to 12 multiplier. And that means the company is overvalued because it's currently at 25. However, if you see it as a disruptive AI based software company, then you should do at least 100 to 125 like Snowflake gets. That means the company is undervalued. That's just the bottom line. How you want to evaluate the company basically depends on what you think of the company and what you think of their scope of operation is. And at the end of the day, it's a question of faith. But regardless, if you like it or hate it, there's one thing you need to remember. And I mentioned this in my previous video. It's an important advice. If this is your last money, I don't want you putting it in the stock market because it's dangerous. You may lose it. We're not profits. This is not exact science. Nobody knows what's going to happen with this stock. We're making educated guesses. If this is your last money you're saving to pay rent and food, I forbid you to put it in the stock market. How about that? If you're not going to listen to me and you're going to still put it anyways, at least get something solid like an ETF or an S&P 500 or Dow Jones. Playing around with stocks should not be done with your latest money. Seeing all these gains this YouTuber show, this isn't normal. They're showing you the gains, nobody's showing you their losses. So just relax and take this as an educational drill. I'm gonna tell you in this video, as a deep dive, what I like about this company, what are the risks about this company. There's not gonna be any sugarcoating because I'm not a fanboy. I don't hold any positions in this company. Not bad, not good, no long, no short. Nothing, I'm an objective referee moderator. I'm gonna give you the risks and the upside. And of course, you already know I'm pro this company. So the end conclusion would be that this company is undervalued, but I'm gonna show you the pathway, the good and the bad, so you can make up your own decisions. So my first order of business before we get to the actual arguments is to show you my current DCF for this company. Now, in case you don't know what a DCF is, a DCF is a discounted cash flow model. This is a good way to evaluate companies. However, it's not really suitable for high growth, high tech, high R&D rated companies because it literally ignores future potential. It's all about current cash flows and projected cash flows. Now, here's the thing. It's not good to evaluate how much the company is gonna be worth in two to three to five years, but it can give us a good objective estimate of what the share price today is, if it's undervalued or overvalued. So let me show you. So as you can see right here, this is my DCF. We have here the assumptions. My federal tax rate is still the 21%. I use a 12% discount rate, a 25 multiplier, that's for tech, a current share price, outstanding debt, and cash. These are my assumptions. Now what I did here is I basically built an estimation of EBITDA, earnings before tax uh, and depreciation, and I built a cash flow all the way to 2024. That's how I see the company. You can argue with me and plug in different numbers. I guarantee you the score isn't going to be much different. Now here you have tax and of course we have tax credits. And this is the really interesting stuff because tax credits for an R&D heavy company are significant. As you can see here, I project they'll accumulate 283 million in tax credits based on all the years they're actually losing money investing it in R&D. So I don't foresee them paying any actual tax in 2022, 2023, and 2024 because of the tax credits they'll accumulate. So right now, this is just the bottom line. I don't like to you know, hold you hostage. Let's just get to the meeting grid. 
So this is the valuation I got, which is 33 billion, which is slightly higher than what they have today. And this is my target share price for today. So if I had to buy the share today, this is what I'm seeing, almost $20. So as you know, right now, the share is traded at 18.15. This is the weekend, so it's not gonna change when I publish this video. So 18.15, meaning that I think that this company right now, currently, is 10% undervalued today. That's just based on current DCF. But this is all here and now. Let's talk about the future, where this company can go in five years, and what are the pitfalls it may face that may prevent it from getting there. Let's get it. So here's the thing about Palantir that you need to understand. Palantir is a unicorn. There's not a single company ever you can find that matches what this company does. Nobody, literally nobody does what they do. It's a very unique business. And beyond all the hype, you have to understand that this company has been around for 17 years. And they've been working with the CIA and with a bunch of governmental agencies forever. In fact, Palantir only started thinking about commercial applications to their products in 2012, which is just eight years ago. And as you know, this is R&D heavy industry. So it took them a while to build these products. And only now we're starting to see some stuff come out in the commercial market. So before that, they were doing a lot of intelligence, security, military applications. Now we get to see also fraud prevention and actual BI, business intelligence, business analytics, efficiency modeling, predictions, all of these stuff that Airbus, for example, is buying from them. This is happening right now. This is just the beginning. Now, here's an important distinction I like to make. I know that there are people who think that this is a consulting firm and that's why they're bearish on this share. And I get it, but I'm not one of them. I think that this is a disruptive AI-based software firm. And that's why I think it's grossly undervalued. Now they have two products. The older product they've been working on for ages, over a decade called Gotham, that's for governments. And they have Foundry, which is kind of the newer product for the commercial market. Um, and we built, we built out PG, which is our government product and our Foundry product. And, uh, and built a way to maintain them so that we wouldn't have to scale the number of people. We had built this way of going to market with Foundry, which would allow us to literally supply an enterprise with a completely new stack of products within six hours and maintain them. Now, in my previous video, I mentioned that ARK Invest actually invested in this company. And some people rightfully pointed out that ARK Invest only have about 0.5% of their next gen internet fund invested in this company, which is 100% true. I'm not arguing that, but here's the thing. ARK Invest is basically Kathy Wood. She's the founder, she's the executive, and she's the chief investment officer, meaning she gets to call the shots. And if you go back and track Kathy's history, that's how she goes in the companies. She starts very, very slow, very, very small, and then buys bigger and bigger chunks as the company going forward. That's what they did with Tesla. And I believe this is the beginning we're actually seeing with Palantir right now. Now, here's the thing. If you take a look at the financials and you compare this year to last year, you'll see that in the past quarter, they're more than doubled the sales and marketing expenses, which is a reason they get criticized right now by a lot of bears. However, what you need to understand that this company had no salespeople until pretty much recently. They didn't believe in sales. They pretty much said, hey, our product sells itself. Our customers don't need salespeople. We work with governments. They've only recently started building a sales force, marketing people, and all of that infrastructure that did not exist. So going back to last year, you have to understand that they're going through a sales ramp up. They're hiring people, building infrastructures. That's not a bad thing. The core mission of our company always was to make the West, especially America, the strongest in the world, the strongest ever been, uh, and for the sake of uh, global peace and prosperity. And we feel like this year we really showed what that would mean. Now, there's a lot of issues with this company that do get criticized rightfully. For example, what they actually do is what you've seen in the old Tom Cruise movie. You remember Minority Report? where that pool had a few people and they kind of predicted crimes and people got arrested before they actually got a chance to do it. There's a philosophical question about the morality of these kind of techniques and Palantir 
have been under a lot of heat, especially for cooperating with ICE. Is this an issue that is controversial and complex enough that the small island in Silicon Valley that would love to decide what you eat, how you eat, and, and monetize all your data should not also decide who lives in your country and on what your conditions? There are elections, there are rules, they should be enforced, a transfer of one presidency to another, and the, the view of Silicon Valley that we get to decide should not be the way these things are decided. I don't know exactly what they did and did not do. It's a morality question and an important one, and they may deserve the criticism. Are you comfortable, though, with the Trump administration's approach on the border? Look, everybody who uh, knows me personally like you knows that I've been a card-carrying progressive my whole life. My family is progressive. I have a degree in what amounts to progressive thought. Obviously, there are many things I would do differently, and I've, I've never stopped being critical of this administration. I'm not planning to uh, vote for this administration. So there are things I do differently. The core issue, though, is who decides. And let me, to the people who want to reduce the complexity, it's commonly known that our software is used in operational contexts at work. Do you really think the warfighter is going to trust a software company that pulls the plug because something becomes controversial with their life? There's a lot of complaints about the stuff they did with ICE regarding immigration and separating kids from their children. A lot of nasty shit. And I believe the company needs to answer for that. 100%. This isn't easy questions. They need to answer. And if they need to apologize and say, hey, we fucked up, they need to come out and say that. However, this isn't the 737 Boeing case at all. Because there, it was blatant fraud, and they lied to airlines and pilots and people and got people killed. This is a whole different situation. I'm never touching Boeing for that again. And I believe people need to go to jail or prison. But this is a completely different story. It's a moral question, and they need to be answered 100%. But I don't see it as a huge enough issue to impact their future growth. We, we, we've always made the decision not to be involved in intrusive software, so offensive attacks inside in the cyber context, precisely because context, because in the cyber context, intrusive infiltrations are, are 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 questionable often and are done almost ubiquitously. And here's the good and the bad of working with government clients. First of all, there's no credit risks. These government agencies pay on time, pay exactly what they need, and there's no issues with payments or defaults or none of that shit. These are what you would call a AAA clients. They're also very, very scarce. There's few of them. So there's a lot of concentration issues. I mean, when you have few clients and one of them leaves, it's a huge impact on your business. And that's another risk you have to handle. However, you do have to consider that this company has been pretty much embedded in all of these agencies for over a decade. Removing them would be pretty much like ripping out your heart. It's not going to happen. Now, here's two points you really need to understand because they're quite critical to understanding the true value of this company. The global AI market is about to hit 126 billion by 2025. That's in four years. This company is literally one of the front runners in this market. So they're primed to get one of the biggest chunks of that market. You can't ignore that. Now, beyond the fact that this is probably one of the only companies outside Zoom and a few other examples who are primed for COVID, their products are built for an environment where everything changes rapidly and chaotically and there's a new world order, new habits, new patterns, everything changes right away. Their software is literally built for that. Government allies to work with. If, if they are in the West broadly defined and if the rule of law has a check and balance system, we work within the context of the law. If, it are, if it's other countries, they have to either be allied with America or we give them a special uh, way of uh, deciding what we're going to do. That concrete, if you're Germany, France, America, Sweden, Japan, it's a very quick process. Now let's talk about their government affiliation. Their U.S. government affiliation probably won't get them hired by other governments, especially hostile governments like China. But they don't want it. Also, they don't need it. Beyond the fact this company is headed to a different direction, the way they understand the market is that they're going to keep their U.S. government affiliation, but their growth is in the commercial market. How much of the business today do you believe is being driven by the government work versus the corporate work? Well, in the last couple of years, most of our revenue has been commercial. Most of our clients have been government. The government, uh, our government work inside and outside of America is so strong uh, because of how it compounds that. It's gone from being 60, 40 commercial go government to probably 50, 50. They want to phase out the government market and go heavy on commercial market. And that doesn't mean jack shit as far as politics. At the end of the day, 
At these companies, politics mean jack shit. They only want to make money. Airbus uses them to make more efficient repairs. Other companies use them to make more efficient drilling. There's a hundred different examples. If this company can save you money, essentially if their product costs a hundred and they're saving you a hundred and one dollars, they're going to get hired. Politics aside, it doesn't really matter. So the government affiliation to the US is first of all phasing out because they're going to go commercial heavy, but also doesn't matter because they don't want it. Now, what about Biden? That's a huge risk, right? Biden is going to cut military spending. He probably hates Pierre Thiel for actually supporting Donald Trump. Well, all of that is true. And I do believe that Biden and the Democrats will cut military spending. But that's exactly the reason why Palantir is going to go huge, because Palantir has the cheaper solution. It's much cheaper to predict and analyze and create incoming solutions from your office than sending boots on the ground to some godforsaken country in the desert. And I like all of these countries, but I mean, come on. Palantir has a much more suitable, cheaper and efficient solution in order to cut military spending. Beyond the fact that this software is pretty much embedded into pretty much every single government agency for the past decade, ripping it out is pretty much impossible. And why would you? It's cheaper and more efficient. And there's also the question of scalability. Can this product be scaled? That's another question that get asked a lot, especially by people who see it as a consulting firm. Again, this is not a consulting firm. There's nothing to scale. They build custom sets of software. And as the client base grows, they'll scale up. That's just the rule of numbers, rules of volume. These are the smartest people in the room. I mean, they're going to get it done. Believe me, the more clients they get in the commercial market, the more this is going to be scalable and automated. I have no issues with that at all. People who claim scalability issues don't understand what this company is and what it isn't. This isn't consulting. This is AI software. By definition, AI software can be automated. And let's talk about the founders. This is a strange company in that aspect. The founders get to keep their voting rights regardless of how much shares go out to the public. It's a weird structure with class A, B, C, D, and F. I'm not going to get into that right now because it's freaking complicated. But the idea is that the founders get to keep control no matter how much shares get sold. Now, it's either a good thing or a bad thing. If you trust them and you think that these guys are smart and you think they know what they're doing, by all means, invest, which I actually do. If you think they're idiots and morons, don't invest. Let's be honest. Tell the truth. How many times did you vote in a shareholders meeting ever in your life for all the companies? I'm sure the number is pretty close to zero. Come on. It's not a huge deal. Now, let's talk about the increased expenditures of this company. People are talking about these expenses. I talked about the sales and marketing expenses, why they're growing, because, you know, the company's pretty much ramping up commercial marketing, which it literally didn't do before. The other part is the stock-based compensation. Now, there's a lot of it and people are like, oh my God, relax. When a company goes to an IPO, a lot of these stock-based compensation actually accelerate invest. There's a few accelerating events, a sale of the company, an M&A event, or an IPO. An IPO, by definition, accelerates this huge chunk of shares that people can actually exercise. That's not a huge deal. That's what an IPO does and you'll never see it in the reports again. That's a one-off much like 54 million, which they had to actually pay for the IPO. So there's a lot of money in these quarterlies that actually are one-off and actually very sensible. Now, listen, don't go crazy with the stock. This is not an exact science. This is an educated guess. This is like casino with a little bit of an edge, but that's it. Don't gamble away your less money on this shit, please. The share may go up. Or it may implode, it may go to zero, like every single share. People tend to discount the risk of the company actually imploding. Any company can implode. So Tom, what about this company? Is it good or is it bad? <laughs> I mean, nothing is good or bad in this world, including myself. Well, I'm pretty good, but not that good. You deserve a straight answer. Let me give it to you. It's a very binary decision. You either like it or you hate it. There's nothing in between. If you think it's a consultancy, then it's overvalued because the multiplier should be 10 or 11. Because if you think it's an AI-based disruptive software company, then you're looking at 125, 130 multiplier, which means it's undervalued, which is where I'm personally at. Make your own decision. Do your own research. This is only my opinion. Blah, blah, blah. I'll see you guys in the next video.